Good afternoon, everybody. You're very welcome here to the O'Reilly Institute. We're delighted to see so many of you here today. As you, my name is Joyce O'Connor, and I chair the uh, Digital Futures Group of the International of the Institute of International and European Affairs, and we're very pleased to be associated with today's event. As you know, today is an amazing week, I think, for AI and for Dublin and for Ireland. The National Standards um, Authority of Ireland, in collaboration with the ADAPT Research Centre here in uh, Dublin and Trinity, is hosting the third plenary meeting of, and it's a, it's a long title, I'll just, I'll just give it to you once, the ISO IEC JTC1 SC42, <coughs> Artificial Intelligence. So we're going to keep it to ISO 42 uh, after that. But this meeting, it's the third plenary meeting. The others have been held in China and in America. So it's tremendous to have this event here. And congratulations to the NSAI and to the ADAPT Reset for making this happen. Because today and during the week, we have a lot of experts, not only our own Irish experts, but international AI experts, which is great tribute. And it also offers a kind of a showcase for what's happening in, in, um, in Ireland and in Dublin and the regions. I'd like particularly to congratulate um, the NSAI. I see Geraldine Larkin down there, Mary White, and Terry Landers. Now, Terry has several hats, I know, <laughs> besides being involved with Microsoft, but he's been very active in, in his chair of the NSAI committee and ICT standards, but also is also chair of this standards group, international standards group. So, um, and to Dave Lewis, Professor Dave Lewis, for asking us to get involved in this event. We're really very pleased. And I'd like to thank our own team here, well, obviously led by Jill, but Owen, Larkin, and um, Fanola, who, who have worked to make this possible. It was very interesting yesterday morning, um, are the, I just better get this right, the Technology Ireland ICT Skills Net held a really very interesting um, breakfast seminar on the title of Artificial Intelligence and Innovation. And it was, uh, Professor Lewis spoke with the chair of ISO 42, uh, Vale Dieppe. And they spoke on that issue, but in fact, all of the other speakers, and there was representatives of Irish business as well, really interesting case studies, what's happening with artificial intelligence. But every one of the speakers, one way or another, spoke about ethics and trustworthiness. Mm -hmm. So in many ways, this is a really good, I'm sure it's done in the planning, very timely. It's timely as well because the um, EU expert group, high level expert group, has just published its uh, report on EI, uh, artificial intelligence and trustworthiness and ethics guidelines. Mm -hmm. And that's been, um, co-chaired by Professor Barry O'Sullivan, who's from Cork. So it's very good to see that. But I know um, Minister Breen and uh, representatives here who are from the department have been actively working with Europe in this area. And we'll be looking at seeing an AI strategy sh shortly. The minister ha has talked about that. So that's very, very welcome. Um, I think today we're particularly lucky to have Peter Brown here. Peter has a stellar career, a very distinguished. I'm not going to give you his full CV, otherwise we'll probably be here for the next half an hour or so. But he has recently been appointed editor of a uh, new S ISO standard, looking at the governance implications of the use of artificial intelligence. And that, that's what he, he, he's doing. But besides that, he's worked in public service in the European Parliament. He's worked in the private sector all over the world, um, several Fortune 100 companies working on, and international um, organisations on technology strategy. He's also worked on ISO standardisation work on information technologies as president of the Identity Ecosystem Steering Group. And that was really important because it was established to deliver uh, President Obama's national strategy for trusted identities in cyberspace. And I know a number of people here are particularly interested in that. He served as president of the 
board and director of the Global Open Standards Consortium Oasis. So he's very familiar with this area and had lots of practical experience. But today he's going to be speaking on ethics and governments issues in artificial intelligence. But I must say he has an intriguing title. And it says, an AI walks into a bar. Peter, we wait the rest of the story. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks for the introduction and thanks for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I should preface my comments um, by with a little confession, that which was that I arrived in Dublin Sunday evening and I wasn't feeling very, very well the first couple of days. And I think um, that experience of being sick in a hotel room in a foreign country, you know, it's, it's one of those miserable experiences you can have. And I was contrasting in my sitting there in my misery uh, the experience sort of 30 years ago when you're stuck in a foreign country and, and today, because today at least you, you can get your cell phone out, you can find out where the nearest pharmacy is, you can chat with people at home, even talk to your doctor, even talk to a robot doctor if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. And it's just fascinating that, you know, this, this little device in your hand is able to communicate with that sort of broader world and give you lots of feedback. And so, you know, it's, it's never fun being uh, ill when you're abroad. I think the only thing worse than that is the inline advert you get while you're going through your news feed saying, Peter, cheapest rates on life insurance in Dublin, Ireland. <laughs> Which then raises a question about, you know, well, where did that come from? And I'm actually going to return to that uh, because I think there's an issue there about the, the sort of discussion we're going to have. Um, no apologies for the fact that the slides... I, I'm not going to do death by PowerPoint, just so you, you're clear. But I wanted to set the scene a little bit with just a few, I hope, sort of educational, sort of Course 101 slides, just at touching the top level of, of my sort of understanding of where the issues of governance, and by that I mean the top level organisational responsibility for what an organisation's strategy, business... Uh, mission, vision, values, ethics and everything is. Basically, as one lawyer put it to me when I was on a board of governors, you're the guy that goes to jail if things go wrong. Yeah. Anybody else, it's optional, but you're the one that's, that's on, uh, on the line. So your job as a, as a governor or as a member of a board is to ask questions, is to probe, to find, to understand how things are, but at a level which has an impact on your organisation. So I think given the fact that AI is so deeply embedded in a broader areas. I wanted to do a sort of quick, uh, quick run through um, some uh, the sort of digital world. I mean, this is the this is the classic model which goes back many decades. You know, you've got what goes on in the real world. You capture the intention of something, like measuring the the temperature in a room. You capture it as data. The data goes in. You've got lots of technology processing that data based on models and processes that you have of, that real, of, of the real world, some data comes out, the outcome is the, th the thermostat or the, uh, will trigger um, putting the heating on or putting the air con on. It's a very, you know, very simplistic model, but most IT systems are modelled on that approach. Looking at the broad issue of governance of data, even that simple model throws up questions. You know, So you're intending to capture the temperature in a room. So is your model correct? Is you, You're doing things the right way. You're capturing enough information. Is the model <coughs> adequate? <coughs> the data that's coming in, where's it coming from? What authority? Who's, who owns it? What's the value of it? What's the quality? Typology, security. So all the way around, you've got questions which are thrown up about the suitability of the data, the suitability of your processes, the technology using, the reliability of what comes out right down to the final sort of bottom, bottom line impact, which is which most private sector uh, bodies are interested in, is you know, <coughs> was all the effort worth it? You know, do we actually gain something from modelling and uh, processing uh, this, this approach? So we've got that already sort of high level consideration of, uh, of governance of data. Where we are today is more complex. We've got the real world still, hopefully, thankfully, holding on to it desperately. Our interaction between the real world and the data coming into the systems are now being intermediated by a whole host of 
interfaces. So I mentioned, you know, being on my, my cell phone. The cell phone's got a microphone, it's got a camera, it's got a keyboard, it's got movement sensors, accelerometer. It can pick up lots of data from the real world, even if I don't want it to, and even when I'm not even aware of it. So there's, even from a simple cell phone, let alone more complex systems, we're getting lots of data into a system level view from extracted from experience of the real world through those sort of interfaces. And the, the technologies that are developing, and this is where we're starting to look more now at AI, that should be plural, AI technologies, or we've had discussions this week about what the term should be. We're talking more about AI systems, I think, is the correct, politically correct term of the week. Um, where the systems are taking the data, they're learning what to do with it based on models and based on training data, and this explosion, and we think it's complex today, think on one projection, which was that by 2030, something like 85% of all manufactured goods will contain connectable components and contain Internet of Things devices. We already have it with washing machines, fridges, you know, sm smart devices in the home and in industry. But in the future, given the complexity of, of, of uh, the uh, supply chain of many goods, a lot of Internet of Things, IoT-enabled devices will be embedded in supply chain and more complex goods by default, whether they're needed or not, because it's just simpler to do it that way. So we're in a situation where more and more interfaces are being provided to the real world, and the growth of AI hopefully is... is fostering new and better ways to process these newer sources of data, much more richer sources of data, and provide results that can be used in the real world, which then throw up lots of new issues as well, both in terms of how, uh, what happens with the data coming out, uh, uh, going through, again, various interfaces with the real world, to outcomes providing more value to, um, hopefully, to society. Um, that, again, throws up complex governance issues. Many of these appeared on the first slide. So they're not, many of the governance issues around AI technologies and IoT are not new. And I think many boards today, and certainly boards that I've talked to, are, feel a little intimidated that, oh, we don't know anything about AI. We don't know anything about these technologies. It's, it's too much for us to cope with. But if you try and break it down to essentials about what a governance, uh, what a governance mechanism needs, or a board needs, a lot of the issues are the same. They may have new implications and new consequences, but they, uh, a lot of them are the same. Um, this is where the AI walks into a bar. So one of, the, one of the fascinating things about AI, at least in one of the areas of AI, you understand it's a, uh, a catch-all phrase for a whole host of technologies, most common being you know, the so-called machine learning uh, technologies, where you've got a set of algorithms running, receiving test data the whole time, understanding, testing against that test data in the real world and making predictions and hopefully making better and more accurate predictions as time goes by, based on the test data and on the real data it comes in. So, you know, the AI walks into a bar. Hang on, it gives me a chance to... Goes up to the bartender. What will you be having? Good evening to you. AI looks around. What's everyone else having? <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. AI in machine learning may be very good in terms of determining, making a projection based on existing or past behavior. The risk from a governance perspective is how good it is, is it at actually predicting future events. And when you take away the magic sauce and the pixie dust and the marketing from a lot of um, the promotions made by uh, companies promoting AI, and particularly the, the machine learning, I think it's important that organizations address the issue of, well, Okay, the models show you've had a 100% success rate on 
test data that you've fed it, and guess what? You've said it's, this is what the result should be, so the result should be 100%. So you've got to be careful about how test, uh, test data is mixed with the real world and how you supervise, and I use the word advisedly, you supervise that sort of process of acquiring new data and, and uh, adapting algorithms that the machine learning system will do. And the, the issue there is, from a governance perspective, where do you, where do you draw the line between um, a sort of high level and light touch um, direction that you're giving to your, either your own technology services for developing AI or to your, um, to your services that are gonna buy in um, uh, through your sort of corporate uh, purchasing, uh, buying capacity for use of AI. These are the sort of questions at a high level that a governance body needs to think about. So they don't need to know the details of how the algorithms work. No, I mean, God help us, I don't think many of the AI people themselves are, are always uh, clear about that, and that's part of the, the nature and the scariness of the beast. But to, the job for a governing body is no different than it ever has been, which is probing, asking the right questions, and ensuring, well, ensuring ultimately you stay out of jail, but to identify the types of questions that need to be asked in terms of being able to um, to uh, address your organization's uh, needs. And when it comes to um, um, organizational, uh, to governance of um, AI, which has been a, a term thrown around for a couple of years, the conclusion we had in our own working group, which is developing the standard on this subject, was we should be careful about the terms we use. I mean, in the standards world, you know, we can, and Terry can vouch for this, you can spend a morning discussing the implications of the word can or use or decision. Because, you know, in some standards that could mean, that could be life or death, death issues if it's a, a critical piece, a standard that's being used in a piece of critical infrastructure. So words are important and terminology is important. But the reason I mention that is because um, in the area of, uh, of governance, you need to understand enough of the, um, the concepts around the technology to be able to understand the implications for you as an organization. Again, some of the, the questions here that come up around AI, uh, more specifically, um, you know, like my AI walking into the bar, I say, well, you know, the, he's, he, obviously, he obviously knows to ask the right question and to... To, to get some feedback or whatever, but it's not really a, an indicator of what he might want, what, what he might, might want to drink. So the question about the suitability of the algorithms, the models, the checks and balances, and then when you, at the other end of the, uh, the other end of the uh, the scale, you've got all the issues about well, okay, you've done all this processing, you've used the AI to develop your system, um, what's it going to do with it? How reliable is the data? Can you understand it? Can you understand the proposed decision? <coughs> Is it understandable in, in, in itself? Is it suitable to what you want to do? Is it re reliable? Um, another issue, obviously, for boards is risk, mitigation of risk, liability, failover, evaluation of, of, uh, of any uh, critical situation. So, again, I don't think any of these issues uh, have changed. The scale and the implications have, and what I want to look at um, in, in the last part of this talk is, is a couple of the issues that come up as a result of that. Um, risk. Now, it's everywhere. Take my little phone call or my, my few minutes on my phone and getting weird out. Um, of the models of the apps that are interacting with me, are they capturing my real intention? If I say I'm dying in a you know pathetic sort of man, man flu type response to my wife um yeah okay i'm not but it's enough of a trigger to to monetize an advert somewhere so as, as i as i discovered to my peril um <laughs> so is the data in there, there could be problems there about the quality when when the data is actually being fed into the technology there's 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 all of these the exclamation marks are sort of indicating pain points in that whole cycle of how technology uses data from the real world and pushes that to actual real world outcomes. And the biggest challenge I think for AI, in my opinion, and it's, this is where I'm gonna hopefully scare you a little bit, is 
the combination of artificial intelligence with cybersecurity. Now, cybersecurity, it's a nice, one of those nice uh, marketing buzzwords. It's basically security of information systems that happen to be connected to in the real world via the internet, which is basically pretty much everything. Apart from, interestingly, a few, um, I've heard uh, recent stories, I don't know if they're uh, uh, reliable or not, about a number of power stations that are talking that going back to manual failover switches, physical switches to take things completely offline physically to, in the case of attack, because they cannot afford a low-risk scenario. <coughs> They've got to have a no-risk uh, fallback position because, you know, okay, the, it might be a very 0.01% risk that something that the nuclear reactor is going to go critical, <coughs> but it's not a risk you want to take, so you want to be able to take it offline. But aside those sort of small, real-world analog um, situations, we're in an uh, increasingly complex and inter uh, interconnected world, and cybersecurity risks and vulnerabilities appear in every single of those touch points. There can be interference with the data that's coming in. You can intercept sensors and tell the, the, the building maintenance system that the room is freezing cold, turn up all the, uh, turn up all the H, HVAC systems to a point where things catch fire. Um, you can interpret, uh, these are all real cases, just, just in case. Um, you can interrupt a sensor on a, a internet connected printer to such a way that you can force it to Overprint at a, at a higher speed, at a higher intensity, to such an extent that the printer will actually catch fire. And normally, next to these network printers, you have a great big stock of nice flammable material called packs of A4 paper. And there have been studies showing that you, in a office block where you've got maybe 20 network printers over 10, well, I, I leave you to join the dots, you know. And that's just, and that's just a cyber attack on interpreting the data coming in right at the beginning here. It's not even, the rest of the system is supposedly working and functioning as per specs. Um, right through to interrupting the data that's actually being, uh, what happens if you start feeding fake news, fake data into the AI system? How do you, um, how do you deal with that? What if your models and your training data have been compromised? It's 14 hours. Indeed. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. I'll take the walk. I'm done. <laughs> well, that's very good, Hugh. That's a really good question. <laughs> How much do you say I owed you for that one? That's big. You only half. We haven't even got to the bar yet. Yeah? No. So much right on. Yeah. But all the way through to, you know, intercepting and uh, 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 manipulating data right at uh, right at the end. So we have this. I don't want to ca characterize it in military terms as a war, as a battle between the good and evil. But there is clearly um, work underway by goodies and baddies to use AI for good to try to identify <laughs> vulnerabilities in systems, to identify where attacks are underway. But equally, there are, um, you, there are online services. Um, recently, well, we talk, talk about it more in the, uh, the Q&A maybe, but um, with Europol, there was a recent presentation of a cybersecurity tact managed by AI as a service available online. Just pay via blockchain to this address. And we will go in and we will go and silently delete, modify, and corrupt data on a public-facing website. So when people visit it, even the, the, site or the site managers aren't even aware that pages have been changed. And we're just coming up to <coughs> European elections, number of national elections. So just put out there that, you know, it's a, it's a scary world we're in. The scarier thing for me, if you just... Um, is there is a thing called, and Terry, you can probably help me if I get it wrong here, um, a, oh, I've forgotten the name of the damn thing now, something, 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 
Um, <laughs> it'll come to me. There's a website which I think is called thisisnotarealperson.com. You might want to have a look at it if you do. What it is, it's a site which is a sort of side, a, a sort of public facing um, spin off from a research project which basically is designed to use AI to test <coughs> the validity of current models and current AI systems. So it's, um, you have a set of training data, you have a system that's running, and then you have this um, additional system which will provide fake or real uh, data in, in the case of this particular website, the, the clues there in the name, it generates artificial images of people who do not actually exist. And you look at the pictures and you think, well, oh, it's a person. No, it's a bunch of pixels generated in real time when you access the site of something that looks like a person. And the reason it's done is not to deceive us. It's done as a test to try and deceive the system, which is the AI system trying to identify between fake and real. The fact that that even exists sort of blew my mind. And you, if, you look at the, if you look at the website and look at the images, you see, wow, this, some of them you think, that's really amazing. Some sort of go off completely bizarre with weird artifacts appearing and half of the side of a spectacle and things like that. But the scary thing is, in the research, is... The AI is very good at generating artificial images, but very poor at distinguishing, or less, less good, to be fair, less good than at distinguishing fake from real images. So we're in a situation where potentially lots of fake stuff is being generated, where humans are better at spotting the real from the fake, but because of the scale and the volume of stuff that can be generated, it's beyond human scale to sit back and filter through the stuff. And I think that is the sort of, for me, governance question about AI, which really, I wouldn't say it keeps me awake at night, but I think it did Monday night, but then I wasn't really sleeping very much then anyway. But, but it's those sort of issues. And I, I gave that one as a, um, and I'll try and remember the name of it, um, The, it'll actually be more than a word, but I think you've got that. Um, the issue comes up inevitably when we talk about governance of AI and responsibilities of an organisation for you using AI. So what about you know, the AI killer robots? What happens if we start embedding AI into military systems and they go autonomous and they start doing bad things? What happens if the, the robots go crazy in the, uh, in the factory and, and uh, um, start damaging property and people and, and, and the business? So there are risks about, uh, you know, should AI be given that degree of autonomy to be able to do these sort of things? It's actually been a core issue in the, we're in the very early stages obviously in our work, but in the early stages of our discussion on governance implications of AI, the issue of ethics in, is there, full, full square in the, in, in the middle of the discussion. And I think it's a fair, I want to try and give a sort of fair summary of the debate as it is at the moment, because I think the jury's out about can <coughs> AI systems be ethical. I have my own view on that and I'm happy to share it, but I'll try and be, I'll try and be a reasonable editor for the moment. Um, for me, the, there are three issues. The first is what I call the danger of anthropomorphism. By which I mean, if we, and technology, marketing departments, researchers, newspapers, everyone are as guilty as everybody else, in every time we talk about AI, you've got a picture of a robot. A robot with a human face, a little smiley, a nice happy face on the screen or whatever. We're humanizing a piece of technology a combination of silicon and code and electricity. Um, I understand the desire for anthropomorphizing, and we were actually talking just beforehand about, you know, the uh, experiments and, and um, 
uh, trial runs of using uh, robots in support of medical interventions and how many patients are very happy with this idea because they feel you know that, that a, a robot system has some precision and accuracy and that he's not going to fall asleep on the job or anything <coughs> else. So on one side, there's a certain comfort zone there. <coughs> but the risk in the broader area of AI, I think that's okay in the area of robotics, but in the broader area of AI, to give a human concept behind uh, what is essentially running code and code that's updating and learning and, and processing the whole time um, poses dangers from a governance point of view because you start then rationalizing decisions that you make based on the idea that this thing has, which is the second word, has agency. That it has some form of autonomy and that it should be treated as capable of making, that's the third word, decisions. So we've got anthropomorphizing a system, giving it the sense of agency, and that through that agency it's able to, to make decisions. And the challenge we have in our group is on each of those three questions saying, do we accept that those are inevitable in any future conception of what AI is? Or do we want to draw a line somewhere and say, thus far and no further, because there will come a point in discussions at governance levels about, oh, well, we can delegate that to the AI. The AI can do the, the hiring for this post, the, and it's already started. Um, the AI can manage the distribution of tasks in this call centre. It's already happening. Up to, uh, we're going to get rid of the whole of middle management because our organisation is now so bureaucratic and rules-based, no manager has any margin of manoeuvre perfect for being taken over by rules-based AI systems. So let's get rid of the whole of middle management. There's some hints here about jobs you should be watching out for <laughs> and avoiding in the future. Um, my point is that if you go for a very strict rules-based approach to human activity, those are the areas where automation is possible. Now, automation for me is not the same as autonomy. Any AI systems, however complex, if they are rules-based, are based on processing and delivering results based on a predefined set of rules. In that sense, in my view, there is no decision making involved because there's no judgment, and judgment is essentially a human characteristic in my view. Therefore, the issue of decision making AI systems, if it's purely rules based, is not a it's not an issue. And for me, if you're on a governing board and you're faced with such a thing, you say, well, if that's what we want, if we want a rules based system that's going to replace very clear business processes or pieces of work which don't require any human agency or any judgment, then those are places where we can use AI. However, a lot of AI systems are not rules-based. They, they're based on various conceptual models of different approaches, algorithmic, um, statistical analysis, and others way beyond my pay grade. Um, but that highlight that... The issues we're talking about are both human impact in terms of what could be beneficial for an organization, but also impact of how uh, the technologies are used. And I think where we are on the issue of ethics, and this is some sort of rounding up, is that to talk about the ethics of an AI system is probably the wrong focus. Organizations and individual humans have ethics and eth ethical behavior. Or companies have codes of conduct. As a civil servant, have a staff code of conduct to follow, and staff regulations. We as individuals follow our own individual moral compass in deciding what's right, what's wrong, and how we behave. We all have ethics and ethical behavior. Not, 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 you know, you'd say the, the mafia has a code of ethics. You know, it's not necessarily one we would share, although it'd be nice to have a standard for you know, Godfather Part 1, Part 2, and Part 3. Um, but it's a code of ethics. And ethics, you must remember, doesn't actually mean being good. Ethics is making a judgment about something that you're going to do, whether you think it's good or not. So it's very difficult objectively to say, yeah, we want ethical AI, and that means... We, we're going to have AI that's going to do good things. So we think that whole debate about the ethics of AI is a bit of a distraction. What we should be focusing on is what are the implications for an organisation of its own ethical framework and its own 
mission, vision, values of the introduction of AI-based technologies or systems in the organization's work. Because based on the sort of things, the threats, the opportunities, the sort of things I've shown, there are obviously masses of implications of uh, where AI is brought in. And this throws up questions that governing bodies need to address. And I think I'll leave it at that for the moment. Thank you.